Hello, everyone. This is the CBO Working Group Meeting at ITF 112. My name is Christian Amsus. Barry Labour is chairing with me and will be joining us shortly. Let's get started. This is an ITF meeting, uh, so the note well applies. This means that this is a public meeting and it is being recorded. It also means that if there is anything in terms of patents or other IPR that you're aware of, please state what uh, state what state state that or do not talk about that topic at all. Um, this also means that we all want to be nice to each other. This is supposed to be a space where everyone can talk up freely. So um, please uh, ensure that people feel welcome here. If you have any questions about any of that. Um, please follow the links that are always in the slides um, indicated here in pink or talk to me or the Ombuds team, depending on what kind of questions arise. On our agenda for today, we have a few topics. Um, first group of first block is working group documents. There I'll just give a, few, a brief update about documents that are sent to the RFC editor or are work in progress without any particular updates that need for the that need discussion here. Then um, filling in for Michael, who is also busy in another meeting, uh, Carsten will uh, tell a bit about issues that have come up late in FileMagic. And then we'll continue with Seaboard Pact, um, looking at the, at the open questions that we all have to answer there before the document can move on. And after that, there will be a few words on the topic of notable tags and, um, and a large block on the future, on future development of, C, of CDL. And apologies for whatever happened in there that it says notable tags. That's why I, I stumbled here briefly. Um, the individual document that should be here is not notable tags, um, which is also something that will need work in the work group, but um, was not planned for today. I don't know what happened here. Um, what should be, it's, it should be saying here is application oriented literals um, extended diagnostic notation, which is something that I'd like to ask about whether or not we should, um, we should adopt that. Are there any changes you'd like to propose? Any additional topics that we should bring up today? Okay, um, hearing none. Uh, <laughs> um, hearing none, let's go to the documents that are uh, that actually have left the working group already. Just giving a brief update on, on what changed there in the steps that not all of you might have followed. Uh, CDDL control got switched over to the standards track and is now in the RFC editors queue. Uh, network addresses um, in the latest iterations after the last ITF gained support for zone identifiers, which may be numeric, may be textual, or may be absent as they always were. And this now is also in the in the RFC editor queue. The time tag document we adopted in May is still active, but this is largely waiting for input from the state working group because whereas much of this is rather uncontroversial. The topics of time zone indication that will also um, be supported in the CWAR time tag will just need to wait for whatever comes out of C date. But judging from having seen the minutes and how, of, how often this has come up in hallway discussions, I conclude that the group is rather active and we really just um, follow what is happening there. If there are no comments or qu um, questions on those documents, I'll hand it over to Carsten for the next topic of CDDL control. Ah, sorry, of file magic. Thanks. So let me try <clears throat> to get my slides there. Nice. Okay, so I have one slide deck for FileMagic, Pact, and 
for CDDL 2.0. Um, so let's talk about file magic first. So what, what do we have at the moment? Uh, we have um, a way to use uh, 555799, which is a tag that already was defined in 7049, um, as uh, together with uh, a one plus four tag, uh, identifying a specific uh, kind of data item and thus the file format to get an eight byte prefix for CBO data items. <clears throat> uh, but that only works for single data items. So if we want to uh, have a magic number for a um, CBOS sequence, uh, then we would use a new tag, which is defined in this document, which is also a one plus two tag plus a one plus four tag. So together we have eight bytes uh, plus um, a conventional content for that uh, tag, which is the um, <clears throat> Byte string BOR, which uh, miraculously becomes CBOR when you look at its representation. Um, so that would be a 12 byte prefix you, you uh, prepend to a CBOR sequence. It stays a CBOR sequence, but it just has this additional uh, entry that, that uh, identifies it as uh, what, what the tag NNNN uh, says. So that um, is uh, stuff we have had for a while. And then we uh, thought, well, it might be nice to actually have pre-allocated uh, tags for CBOR content formats. There are two to the 16 uh, CBOR content formats. So that uh, only takes a small byte out of the one plus four um, tags. So we uh, define uh, one one plus four tag for each of the two uh, two sixteen um, content formats, and we actually managed to do this not with a table but with a simple uh, arithmetic. And um, so th that was all fine, and we thought we were done. Um, but uh, then uh, I made a big mistake and uh, put in examples into the document that actually are non CBO content formats. Um, so the, all this, the things on, on this slide really work with data that are in CBOR form, either a single CBOR item or a CBOR sequence. And um, of course, uh, the mechanism just doesn't work uh, for data that are not uh, CBOR shaped. Uh, so the, these examples are, are really misleading. And uh, the, the comments came in that uh, we would need to do byte string wrapping uh, for these data to fit them into either 555-799 or 55-800, um, which one could do, uh, but then it would no longer be a constant prefix that you just have to slap in front of uh, your your data. So it would be more work. I mean, it's, it's not a killing amount of work, but it would be more work. And it would make it harder to peel off um, that uh, prefix, uh, so it, it would be a, a much worse situation. Um, in addition, you wouldn't necessarily know whether you need this byte string wrapping or not. So this 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 is a non-starter. That doesn't make sense. Um, so uh, we, we wanted to have a, a version of the document ready for the, the deadline for this ITF, um, but that uh, threw a monkey wrench in, into that. So uh, we since have uh, uh, discussed this some more and uh, came up uh, with the idea that maybe we spend another tag, uh, which would be 55801, um, which uh, is essentially works like 55800. So you prefix it uh, to something, uh, but the, the something that you prefix it doesn't need to be CBO data. Um, so this this would be almost but not entirely unlike a CBOR uh, sequence. Um, this is this works with CBOR decoders that can decode one item and then hand up the raw data for the rest of the input. So for instance, in, in the Ruby CBOR um, implementation, there's an interface called decode with rest, which takes one item of uh, um, data um, of binary data, a byte string file, and uh, gives you the, the decoded item plus the, the rest of the 
data in undecoded form and this this is exactly the the api that would be needed for this and uh, yeah that, that happens to be a relatively common api i, ca I cannot guarantee it's um, everywhere uh, but if you don't have that api just read the first 12 bytes and, and decode that so so that should uh, do uh, the job so with the addition of this, we would be able to actually uh, define file magic for all um, co-op content formats, uh, which I think is, is desirable, but it's a bit of a scope creep for, for this document, I must admit. So um, I think this is not a no-brainer, but, but we, we should think about that. Um, so, <clears throat> assuming that, that we can uh, reach consensus um, to uh, put this in, uh, the, the job would be to actually put it in, to um, keep this non seaball content formatting with 55801s. Um, and again, the examples that I, I made kind of <laughs> assume that we already have that, uh, but it, it doesn't distinguish between CIVA and non CIVA, so that, that was the problem. So these examples would be kept, but changed to talk about 55801. And we would add a couple of examples that actually have a CIVA content uh, format uh, using 55799 and 55800. So that would be dash 07, and then we would go for working on glass call with that. So that's my plan. Comments, questions? Michael, please. Um, so I think that the 55801 is a good solution. Um, and, but I, I did ask, I don't know if we have this problem. And so I would a little bit tend to, unless someone really thinks we should do that, I would tend towards let's not go there and just just stick with what we have. I'm also concerned about the review content comments that will result in these things that are way beyond Seabor. So we have one comment in the yep. chat that says uh, add 55801. Um, just to, to, to get a bit of a better view, um, would we still have use cases for seaborne, uh, for number, for, uh, content format numbers in all those three categories? That is 55799, 800, and 801? Yes. Or can, could we slim this? Uh, is, is there any of those that is kind of, um, where, where we don't really have a full use case? Well, if we didn't have a use case, we, we shouldn't do it. Um, so, um, yes, I think that there are um, examples, meaningful examples that can be put into uh, the document. And I think it's useful to have these examples because we are now, now opening up a choice of two, three different ways to do things. And uh, it, it certainly helps to explain when you use what. So just um, t taking taking my document shepherd um, hat here, um, the byte string version has been in there for the the dash o five and dash o six versions, which was what the working group last call um, covered. So um, I'd like just to point out that if we if we extend the scope here, this will put the document through um, definitely through another working group last call and probably a bit of designing on the way there. Um, one thing that was pointed out in previous discussion that might help here is that um, many of the things this document kind of set out to do are already have already happened by early registrations, which as I checked only affect the kind of the, the parts unaffected by all this. So that's not a reason not to do it. It's just something that I'd like to put out and make people aware of. Um, if there's any urgency on the rest of the document.
Yeah, more. just to, to give an example, the, the one example that, that I would build for uh, 55801 would use uh, the content format 11542 application slash vnd.oma.lwm2m plus tlv. Because that, that, that's a weird format that where it really helps if you actually can identify it by, by a magic number. Christian, I think you, your audio totally broke down now. Um, hang on. Mm. Um, is, is this better now again? Yes. Okay. Um, so I've heard a bit of, um, I've heard some positive um, some positive input and some cautious input on going forward. So I suggest that this can be explored in a Dasher 7 um, and the, that the examples there will hopefully um, make the use case clear enough that we can go on with this. Thank you. Then next up is Karsten again with PACT. Yeah, so this is <clears throat> the slide ahead in July. Um, so the, the main issue is stable building. Um, and um, I think we, we need to not boil the ocean here, uh, but on the other hand, have something that, that has batteries included. Uh, so I'll come to that uh, in a minute. Uh, maybe I use, should use the fact that this points to Chris Zip's records uh, tag proposal for a quick intermission. So I just sent uh, some, some additional comments to him on the mailing list. And I think that that's a pretty good proposal. And uh, people, if you um, can, um, if you think you, you have comments on that, uh, please send them to, uh, to the, the list because I think that will be a pretty useful addition to our library of tags. So let, let's uh, go to uh, PACT. So PACT really is three things. It's a processing model, uh, which is uh, in, in contrast to, to actual compression schemes based on in-place usage of, of the packed uh, data item. So you do reference chasing in, in uh, the um, data you got. Uh, then it's the registration of a number of uh, tags and simple items that allow you to reference uh, items. So the, these are the, the origins of those arrows um, that the processing model foresees. And um, I think we, we have a pretty good understanding where in the CBO basic data model uh, we have the gaps where we can put these references in. And uh, finally, and this is the part that isn't quite as stable as the rest, um, the, the table building and in particular the, the nesting aspect uh, where we may have more than one uh, place in the, the data item where something is added uh, to the table. And I think we, we now have a pretty good understanding of, of a push model or shift model, depending on, on how you think about it, where you essentially have a stack of tables and uh, pushing something on the stack um, means that uh, you get control over the lowest numbers in the various reference and the various referrer encodings, encodings um, and push the existing table entries up uh, to higher numbers. So I think that, that is now well understood, if maybe not fully described, so that, that's probably a place where, where at least editorial work is needed. And uh, basically what I think we, we uh, should be doing um, in the base document is uh, provide 
Um, the referrals, of course. Um, so we, we have uh, allocated tags and, and simple items for sharing, for uh, adding prefixes and for adding suffixes. Uh, we describe the table model, uh, including the push mechanism. And we probably should describe this in a way that we can add future kinds of referrers, uh, for instance, uh, using the record or template uh, proposals. So the model is extensible, but we only fill it in for the three kinds, share, prefix, and suffix. Um, we add a basic table setup tag that is making use of the push model and pushes to the share, prefix, and suffix. Uh, tables. So that, that's pretty much already there. It, it probably just has to be qualified as something that, that is just one way to do things. And uh, then we provide a framework for defining more specific setup tags, uh, where um, I think we, we should foresee two kinds of setup tags, but of course it, it's always possible to define other tags. It's, uh, just uh, these are the two that I expect we will make uh, a lot of use of. One is an implicit reference. So if an application protocol defines a dictionary, um, like we, we did 20 years ago with the, the SIP um, encoding, SIP compression um, dictionary, there is an RFC that has the, the bytes of the dictionary uh, in it. And uh, similar here, you would uh, write in the specification that, that um, allocates this tag, uh, the actual table that would be pushed on to this uh, push model uh, for tables. So the advantage of course, is that you can have very, very short setup tags um, if the application uh, requires that. Um, and uh, you, you don't have to do complicated lookups. It's really just a tag. When, when you implement a specific application, uh, then you implement the tag for that as well. Uh, and then you have your application specific dictionary included. Um, so this, this is kind of for standardized dictionaries uh, where, where standardization doesn't necessarily mean going through ISG, but somebody makes the effort and writes a specification that, that uh, then registers a tag. And uh, the other part of the framework should be hashed references. So the, the table set setup tag uh, would include um, a hash value and probably also a COSI algorithm identifier, COSI hash algorithm identifier um, to um, explain how the hashing is suppo supposed to be done. Um, hashing, of course, needs a specification for how the hash input actually should look like. And um, that, I think, should be pretty obvious by, by simply hashing the CBOR deterministic encoding of an equivalent basic table setup tag. Um, so um, we, we don't have to invent a lot of, of uh, mechanism for this. We, we have everything. We just have to put it together uh, in the right way. And uh, of course, an implementation might just implement a number of those hashed references, or it might have a way to actually get that hashed reference somewhere. Um, th that's not really something that the, the data form defines. It just says, if you have, um, a hashed uh, setup tag uh, with this uh, hash, um, then uh, insert it here. So that's my plan for the base document. And then we can, of course, go ahead and do circumfix and uh, template and record and, and whatever kinds of packing uh, uh, we come up with. Comments. Just for for understanding, uh, 
the um, rec records would then be a use case of of packed and whoever defines the records would set up the table to have the, these specific semantics. Is that the intention? I don't know. OK. Um, I think the, the record proposal in, in its standalone form, uh, as it is defined today, maybe with a couple of tweaks that, that I've identified in my mail, that's actually viable. So we wouldn't need to put it into the uh, framework. Uh, but maybe we want to. So um, I think that that depends a lot on, on what applications this uh, tag would be used in. Okay, thank you. Hank? Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you, everybody. This is Hank. Um, so unfortunately, Brandon cannot uh, hear with us today uh, due to a, a time conflict. But I want to highlight um, that uh, I think it would be really cool to use the uh, um, now um, finalizing uh, suit manifest specification uh, as an example for Ciber Pact. Um, I think that would be uh, something we can start after this is uh, moving out of the gate, uh, as because this, this will take some time. But I think it's, 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 it would be an excellent uh, exercise to to instantiate this uh, in real life. So can can you explain use as an example because that that triggers some different neurons for me. <laughs> okay, so I think that uh, there is a lot of redundant uh, references in in directives and and uh, for example identifiers for several things like classes or environments or software for effectively uh, in the suit manifest. And uh, my assumption is that, and, 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 and Brandon really works on trimming down every single byte. And I think uh, as, as the, the manifest is already pr pretty much compact, uh, I assume that the packed uh, uh, approach will still uh, yield a significant reduction of size. So, so that is something I would like to just, uh, well, uh, um, try out. Yeah, I, I'm just wondering whether you want to use it as an example in the document. No, 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 no. Uh, okay. it's, it's, so, so it's, it would be the suit 2.0 <laughs> or the suit packed manifest, you know, uh, because we can't do this with a real one. If if we delay this any more further, some will, will throw stones at me. So, so that, that isn't possible. But uh, but immediately as this is stable and out, I would like immediately redo it with packed. To be honest. Yeah. Okay, one, one interesting question, of course, would also be whether you can simply use suit as is plus packed as is and get anything useful out of that. Yeah, that, that is that is part of the experiment. So uh, uh, we have to uh, find out. So, But again, Brandon and I will not be doing this this year, to be honest. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, but, uh, but, but uh, may, maybe around the next hackathon before the IETF in, in some hopefully uh, actual location, that would be nice. Okay, so that, that maybe leads into to a general uh, request for data items. So if, if you have any data items that, that are not entirely trivial and that would uh, maybe benefit uh, from CBAR Pact, we might want to collect these data items uh, in a repository so we understand what, what CBAR Pact does to them. And, and of course also how, how good different Packer implementations would be because the Packer implementation can have different qualities of implementation that there is no one way to pack things. Christian here, um, brief question on Packer implementations. Do you expect these to be widely used? Because my impression was that the uh, that most of the most of the time packing would be done in a more static way so that the application would use its information on the structure already to create the tags. Do you think that kind of um, free form compression is something that we'll need to expect in the um, in, in applications? 
that that is a good question. <clears throat> so, uh, if you have a generic picker, we should, probably should call them this way, um, then you may save some time in your application actually doing these things. Um, but of course, it requires to actually build the full structure and then submit it to the picker. So it it's not something you would do in a constraint implementation. In a constraint implementation, you would always generate uh, SIBO uh, packed <coughs> right, right from the <coughs> data that you have. Um, so yes, I see some, some areas where generic packers might be useful. And that's why I think it, it's a good idea to collect some, some uh, best practices for building them. Uh, but um, also the, the um, what do you say that packing friendly SIBO encoder APIs um, might also be an interesting subject of, of doing hacking work. I see Hank in the queue. Yeah, just one quick question, um, because I have no gut feeling for this. Uh, how easy or effective would be an auto pack feature in contrast to a manual, manually, uh, I'm going to say configured packing of content where you maybe you, where you guide that a little bit? Should be this almost the same in the end? Well, that depends on how much machine learning and, and AI you put into your packer. <laughs> okay. um, but uh, generally, writing compressors is, is a, a pretty well understood area mm -hmm. of work. Uh, so I would expect that if you write a generic packer, uh, that will often be as good um, as your manual uh, packing uh, scheme is. And it will also find some opportunities for packing that you simply didn't address in your manual uh, yeah. work. So yeah. in, in uh, effect, it might be better. Yeah, maybe not compared to Brandon, but, but in general, yes. <laughs> Good. On the queue. So let's go on. I don't think that there are don't, there are prepared slides for the for the um, for the EDN. Is no. there something that that you'd like to say there, or um, shall we keep that for for basically last um, for, for the AOB section? And so let's have... do it now. Um, so we had some some uh, positive feedback during the interim. Um, we haven't implemented that yet, which always makes me a little bit hesitant of of going for something like a working class troll, Hi, Barry. Um, but uh, we might uh, go for adoption. That that certainly would be possible at this stage. Um, so maybe just a brief um, show of hands around uh, around the room, given that we have um, almost 20 participants. Um, could you please indicate uh, using the uh, show of hands tool whether you have um, well, whether you are interested in that document in in the, for for working the working group? Um, well, I just have to find the right yeah. I take this as kind of a preliminary show of interest in the in the document. This is not kind of on, on its own an adoption call that will be later on the mailing list, but this is just a brief um, brief thing to to gauge the interest in the room. And I see a lot of hands going up going up here. So um, um, in in the minutes, please note that this is. Um, even within a short, um, within a short um, show of hands, uh, showing seven out of twenty uh, raised and none not raised. So to me, this shows that there is interest in the working group, 
and I think I'll, um, we can handle the rest of the mailing list. Thank you. Next item, please. Okay, so <clears throat> let's go to CTDA 2.0. Um, we have talked about that in, in, the, in the last uh, full IETF meeting, 111, and I gave some, some hints for how this and that particular piece of it might look like. And what I want to do today is maybe give a little bit more structured uh, overview over where I think CDDA 2.0 should go. And um, well, we have done a few low hanging fruit in the um, CDI control uh, specification, which gives us a few things that, that uh, are already good on the way to 2.0. But there, of course, we only could do things that didn't actually require changing CDDL. We just used its extension points. And what I'm describing now really is going beyond using extension points. And uh, to me, it seems that there are two um, aspects that uh, are also low hanging fruit, but uh, low hanging on, on the way of actually extending the language. And uh, one is annotation and the other one is composition. <clears throat> so let, let me talk about those starting with composition. So right now, uh, CDDL works with a single file. I mean, we don't even talk about files because uh, um, th there is no file structure, so there's no, no reason to talk about files. But in practice, you have a single CDDL file. Maybe you concatenate that together out of several input files. Um, but essentially, the, the thing is a sequence of rules. And the first rule, uh, which must be a type and not a group, um, is the entry point. So um, at, at surface value, the uh, whole CDDL file defines one data type. And <clears throat> this, this has been uh, quite useful, but uh, we probably want to go beyond that. And I think what I'm uh, here most is that we actually want to build libraries, uh, which are CDDL files that export one or more rules, well, typically types, but might be groups as well. And uh, we also want to be able to import those rules from another CDDL specification, whether that was intended as a library or as a standalone um, CDDL specification doesn't make a big difference. Um, so we want to uh, have an export interface and an import interface. And um, to, to be able to do this, it probably makes sense to actually be able to name the library. Um, so when you do an import, you, you have something you can talk about what you are importing. And uh, you also want to control the naming of the exported or imported uh, rule. So an existing CDDL spec might want to export something, but Maybe it, it has a very short name in, in that spec and the, there are reasons why you don't want to change it. I come to those reasons. And you want to export it um, under a more useful uh, name. Or when you import something, uh, that uh, something may have a very short name in, in its uh, context, um, but uh, in the context where you are pulling it into, that short name is misleading. Uh, so if you import something that has the, the rule name signature and you have a, a specification that has three different kinds of signature, you don't want to call it signature. You will want to call it full signature if, it, if it's coming from the full specification. So there, there is some manage, management of names uh, needed. <clears throat> so um, I have shown a, a simple way of doing implicit importing. Um, so we might have a convention that uh, causes a tool to actually uh, find a library and, and reference things uh, from there. So RFC 1990.oid uh, might be something that, that at some point uh, every CDDL uh, tool will understand. So you don't have to, to do lots of uh, things to actually uh, get it. 
And if you actually need a short name, you can simply write another rule and say OID equals RFC 1990.OID, and um, then you uh, will have a short name for, for this thing. So the, the implicit mechanism would be an easy way um, to do things without completely leaving the CDA 1.0 um, envelope. Uh, but of course, the tool has to support doing, doing this uh, lookup. And uh, the, the <clears throat> more powerful explicit import would identify a library, uh, maybe identify a versioned sequence using a semantic versioning reference. So that, that's a um, very popular subject. And I think the young people have been discussing this for about two years now. So maybe we can actually steal something from them. And um, then when you have identified the library, you want to manage what names are introduced. I talked about name management, potential conflicts, and so on. So this will, will be the explicit uh, import uh, interface. I'm not putting an example in here because I come to the syntax uh, in, in a few uh, slides. So the um, export. Uh, interface would uh, provide a way to name the library. So you don't just have an anonymous CDL file, but the CDL file itself says w under which name it expects to be imported. Um, gives a version number, probably, semantic version number. And uh, you probably also want to identify the rule names that uh, th this library intends to export. So this is not, not a required list for the um, importer, it's just the default set. So if you just import the library without saying anything else, uh, you get this, this exported rule set, uh, but you can import less and you also can import more uh, so we are not, not trying to do protection of uh, uh, class internals here. Uh, I mean, if, if you do that, then you know that you are doing something on your own. So if, if the, the next uh, version actually changes the name of a rule, then, then you have a little problem. But <clears throat> in particular, during development of things, that, that may be a much too useful thing to leave out. So um, the, the question, of course, is how do we do the linkage? So somewhere on my laptop, th there is a CDL file that says it exports foo, and somebody else, somewhere else, there is a, a CDL spec that says it imports foo. But how do the these two files actually meet each other? And uh, one way, of course, is doing this outside the specification. Um, language. So you, you essentially give some CLI parameters that, that uh, tell the tool that uh, these uh, specification files are going to be used as the library files going into that other um, specification. So that, that's certainly one way to do it. And that, that's, again, useful during development. Uh, when the, the specification has become more established, uh, and maybe even standardized, um, it should be possible to, to give a hint inside the spec. Uh, for instance, a URI that points to a GitHub repository or something. Um, so you, you don't have to uh, repeat all that information in, in every uh, call of, of a CDDL tool. So I don't have a problem with hardwiring GitHub uh, in here, just as long as we have other ways of uh, referencing repositories as well. Um, yeah, namespacing, um, th that's probably the best way to handle these, these name conflict and, and bad naming uh, issues. So RFC 1990.OID already shows the idea of a namespace. So there is an RFC 1990 namespace uh, from which we import the, the OID uh, rule. And while we are at it, we could maybe uh, make the, the one word that um, the that 8610 has, where we have a, a defined prelude that is uh, always imported. Uh, we could make this part of the model so you actually get 
control over that. This is a little bit like C++ using namespace std, um, except that uh, you don't, um, the, the default is to, to actually do that and uh, you would have to do extra work to not do that. And um, maybe we actually want to, to think about some mechanisms that allows you to continue working when you have some, some namespacing um, errors. Um, in particular, if, if you work with revisions, uh, that might uh, happen quite often. So that's the namespacing. Um, let's talk about alternatives. Um, many people want to use the same CDDA specification for different formats. Um, so, uh, for instance, you have one specification that explains how to do CentML in, in JSON and another one how to do it in uh, CBAR. And we know how to do this manually. The CentML specification defines it a manual way. Uh, CDDA control gives an example of another manual uh, way, but we probably want to, to make this a little bit more first class. Um, so uh, we um, don't do this on the lexical level alone because that always makes it hard for implementations to actually process this. So if we make the alternatives first class, we might actually be able to define, uh, to, to write a tool that does translations between the two uh, representations. I mean, in, in, if everything lines up <clears throat> uh, properly. So this would not be part of the specification, but it would be an, an interesting uh, implementation uh, project. So that's why I want to have alternatives be first class and not uh, just be done on a lexical level like in the CNML spec. Um, finally, we should make this whole thing more uh, accessible uh, to automation. It should be able to actually generate uh, libraries. Um, so you, if you have an RFC that has some CDL in it, and I think we, we now have a two-digit number of those, um, it should be possible to generate the libraries from those automatically, and that should also be possible for new IDs. So we probably want to establish a few conventions how you expose um, CDDL uh, in a draft. Uh, we cannot define new conventions for RFCs, but we can define them for, for new drafts. Uh, we want to be able to generate libraries from IANA registries. There are several registries that are just very, very useful. Uh, think about interface types. Um, which you just want to be able to, to use um, in a specification. And of course, the, the, what I'm saying here for, for documents and registries is not just for ITF sources, but th this should also be possible for non-ITF sources. So if, if there are interesting registries or interesting documents that we want to extract uh, CDDA uh, from automatically, uh, that we should uh, look at those. And um, yeah, that should be possible from a CDDL spec to trigger that automation, not in the sense of uh, we, we run a random operating system command, that's always a bit uh, dangerous, uh, but it should be possible to just point to an internet draft and say, I'm, I want to import the CDDL from there and put it in that namespace and, and that should be possible. That's probably not the way you actually publish your specifications in the end. Um, because, well, of course, you would reference an RFC and, and no longer an ID and so on. Um, but it would be good to, to make the language accessible for this kind of automation. OK, let's talk about syntax uh, for a second. Um, the idea is to do this transition from 1.0 to 2.0 uh, in a way that you won't notice that it happened. Um, so CDL 1.0 files should still be uh, 2.0 files. And CDA 1.0 processors should be able to do useful things with 2.0 files. They won't be able to do everything that you can do with 2.0 files, but uh, uh, it, it would be good if 
these processors uh, can uh, process uh, 2.0 files. And uh, yeah, there, there are several places where we can uh, uh, stash things into 1.0 syntax. Um, yeah, that, that's one way of doing it, but this needs to be designed. So I'm not sure how exactly it will look like, but I showed some examples um, at IITF 1.11. Okay, so this is the um, syntax. Um, finally, uh, the other part that I think we should be doing in 2.0 is annotation. Um, CDDL has a processing model that uh, can be described with Koenigan's car, um, which interestingly doesn't have a Wikipedia entry, so you will have to find it somewhere else. Um, so you put in an instance and a model and the thing says yes or it says no. Um, and we have extended that with dot feature a little bit, but that, that's still the, the main processing model. Um, the CDDL tool can do more. It can annotate a tree with rule names. So that's really useful, um, but there is no control the spec writer has about that. So is it important that the um, data item matches text? Or is it maybe more important that it matches uh, country? Um, so a lot of these rules are actually noise when you annotate uh, trees. And of course, you want to be able to uh, put information into the specification that goes beyond uh, rule names. And finally, rule names are, are these things that don't have a relationship to, real, to the real world. So maybe we should do something about that. Other validation languages have something called a post schema validation instance, which is a term I would like to avoid, but let's use it for now. And the PSVI actually uses the validation process to augment the data with, for instance, with annotation information and possibly even to transform it. So filling in default values, constructing data from uh, data that, that has been parsed and so on. Um, this is all things that can be done in a PSVI. We don't want to reinvent XSLT, so the transforming mechanism will be limited. Um, but um, yeah, something maybe is, is uh, uh, useful here. Um, the interesting question is what is the data models for that? Um, and uh, it's probably useful to be able to put attributes on, on any data item and maybe even to have some richer types. Um, maybe even things like application-specific EDN. Um, so we would need to think about uh, representations in various forms, and particularly in SIBA diagnostic notation. So for annotation, I think the, the minimum viable uh, product is uh, to uh, be able to put attributes on uh, rule names. So you can select which, actually, which rules actively annotate and maybe associate rule names with some real world concept that you are, I think I talked about. Uh, you might have uh, special description attributes that you just uh, extract out of comments, some additional spec writer defined attributes. So for instance, a unit could be added to something. Uh, and um, yeah, you could even generate tags tags that are not on the wire because the schema implies them. And this already can be, in, in many cases, can be taken from the un unwrap information. So I, if I have a tilde time somewhere, I know that that number is, is a tag one uh, time. Okay, and final slide, uh, how quickly should we, able, should we be able to do this? Again, I think this is low hanging fruit. Uh, so my objective is to have a prototype and a written up spec by the end of the year for composition and probably for first elements of annotation, but that probably requires some more playing around with, uh, with uh, actual applications. And uh, my objective is to have uh, a complete spec at IATF 113. And uh, well, we, then we can decide what, whether we are done or want to split this document and publish parts of it and publish other parts later after some more experience. Uh, 
Uh, but I think we can only discuss this at IETF 113. Comments, questions? Hank? Hello, Hank, please un unmute yourself. No, I'm, I'm, I'm muted. I'm just being polite, okay. I guess. <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, maybe my mic did open. Okay, yeah, so this is Hank. Uh, obviously, I'm a strong supporter of this. Um, we encountered uh, several uh, pain points uh, without a strict composition feature. Um, this also includes uh, how we define code points in uh, over maps, like uh, are they global for a, a document or are they uh, specific to certain subsets of a single CDA? Sorry, I'm saying document here, but what I mean is a CDA data definition. And uh, so, so yeah, this this really uh, so we have. Uh, a lot of ideas how this works, uh, and I hope uh, some of them uh, we can find consensus on in this document. That would be really, really great, uh, especially because I do not think that these documents will come to uh, working group last call before IETF 113. So uh, if this timeline is realistic, that would be awesome because then we can incorporate it already. And so, uh, so yeah, I, I'd uh, say I would even go so far in uh, splitting out more time uh, to do this. And uh, I'm in full support of that part. Um, on the annotation part, uh, unfortunately, again, Brandon is not here. Uh, I think he has some uh, really, really uh, constructive views on this. And so maybe in the next interim, uh, we can Reel him in and, and elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, we might, might also run a design team meeting if we want. Yeah, sure. The, that is yeah, that is even better uh, if we if we uh, have a higher frequency on on that, and then we can use the interim to uh, uh, discuss uh, uh, a major uh, turning points or something like singularities or something. Yeah, I just wanted to to bring that up too. Um, so design this is a, this is an ambitious timeline. Um, if if this is to work, I think this will need design team meetings in addition to the interims. Um, the my rough plan would be to start interims again in um, around December fifteenth, in in our regular schedule. Um, but even with these and the holidays in between. Um, this this will a lot of work by by the authors. Um, speaking of which, um, Hank would you, um, Hank and Carsten would you uh, would you collaborate on this document, or do you have um, are, are there other uh, interested parties that have shown up so far that would that would volunteer to work on this too? I mean, it's not a working group item yet, so it's uh, technically speaking, it's still up to you, Carsten. Um, yeah. But Anticipating. Um, yeah, I expect that that I will write something like a seed document, and then people will will come in and and contribute, and at some point we decide they are co-authors. Uh, um, so I, I didn't even think about that yet, but I know that Hank has been uh, pinging me whether I'm going to do everything about this uh, for a while. So I knew that Hank was going to contribute and. Um, Brendan, of course, would, would make an awesome contributor or co-author. Anybody else who has an opinion on this wants to write text or code? As, as, a, as a user of Seabor, um, I'm not sure I will write much text or code, but I'm quite looking forward to the annotation features and especially curious whether this um, this work might allow later to not only um, very um, to, to use the to use the ver validation uh, to extend annotation uh, in such a way that you can also verify whether your CDDL allows unambiguous annotation because right now, Validation is always unambiguous, but many um, CDDL documents out there do not allow unambiguous um, annotation. And if if 
if the annotation extensions facilitate and be um, checking this, I would appreciate this a lot. Great. Hank, again? Yeah, uh, again, this, thank you, Hank. Um, so um, I haven't brought this up yet because that is kind of, there's not, nothing really tangible yet. So uh, take this with a grain of salt, but uh, I think that some um, supporters and they are rallying fast at the moment due to some other uh, things like in the cozy realm, uh, a CDDL IDL might manifest at least requirements for it that is close uh, coming closer to the annotation part so uh, uh, an idl might not uh, so so the messages for the input open for rpcs basically make up like a, a i don't know majority portion of all of that so there might be uh, again external syntax that can glue that together and 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 that might make use of some of the annotation parts so I'm just highlighting this because this is just all, I don't know, a pipe dream today, but it might manifest faster than uh, one thinks in the next months. And so uh, uh, why is this interesting? Uh, because there might be authors on that uh, from that pool of interested people, but I could not name a single one uh, today uh, with, with any uh, um, reliability. So the um, I was in the skim meeting two hours ago, and uh, that would be a nice benchmark for doing something like that as, as CIM. Um, uh, Barry is uh, co-chair for that, so maybe he's now in in fight or flight mode. Uh, that that uh, we might want to contribute something to that, but. Um, we can use it as a benchmark, and if it turns out to be useful, we can still try to contribute to the standardization effort. I um, have to highlight that the other project that is really interesting in the CDDL is also called SKIM. <laughs> but it's a totally different SKIM. <laughs> it's the supply chain integrity model. So, yeah. Maybe we should just start going for five letter acronyms. Yeah, probably this is the time now. Like with the five-digit RFC numbers or RFD numbers or whatever we're going to call them then. <laughs> okay. Um, we are um, already in overtime, so um, I take any last comment if there is still one. Um, other than that, um, thanks everyone for all your input. Um, as I mentioned, interims are planned to resume in the same um, cadence that we had them uh, in, uh, during the last ITS, um, probably starting December 15th. Um, mail will go out on that, and also always also on um, topics that um, topics that we just um, took a rough reading on here. For example, the interest in interest in EDN. Um, with that, read you all on the mailing list. Thanks and. Have a nice rest of the ITF. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.